Okay, tell all your friends we're live. We did it. Hare Krishna. So, it means Purusha, the human being, Sukhala. Hare Krishna. Okay. Subhava, by his own acquired qualities. Vihita, prescribed. Yota, according to. Varna, classification of castes. Yota, according to. Ashrama, orders of life. Vairakya, detachment. Raga, attachment. Upadibhya, out of such designations. Amnanta, systematically. Ubhaya, both. Lakshana, symptoms. Translation, at Maharaj Yudhisthira's inquiry, Bhishma Dev first defined all the classifications of castes and orders of life in terms of the individual's qualifications. Then he systematically in twofold divisions described counteraction by detachment and interaction by attachment. Report. The conception of four castes and four orders of life as planned by the Lord himself, Bhagavad Gita 4.13, is to accelerate transcendental qualities of the individual person so that he may gradually realize his spiritual identity and thus act accordingly. Thus act accordingly to get free from material bondage or conditional life. In almost all the Puranas, the subject matter is described in the same spirit, and so also in the Mahabharata, it is more elaborately described by Bhishma Dev in the Shanti Parva, beginning from the 60th, 60th chapter. What's being referred to as Varnashram. I mean, Prabhupada uses the word caste system because that's what people call it, but of course, as soon as you say caste system, it's like, that's not good. But it's actually called Varnashram. And Varna means occupation, Ashram means your status of life as a student or a married person or a retired person or a renounced person. And Varna means your, what, what do we call that in, uh, what would we call that now? Like you, when you do a test to understand your nature, there's occupation. Yeah, occupation, Some, something else. Isn't there another name? To understand your nature. Standard. That's Prabhupada's. No, what? Aptitude. Yeah, like what are you? Are you a, an artist, a musician, a scientist, a business person? Like you. Aptitude test. To try to find. So Varna is aptitude. So, but the difference in Vedic culture is according, it's not just your aptitude, but there's qualities that go with it. So if you are a Brahmin, which means you're a teacher, but there's certain qualities you must live by to be a teacher. You have to be exemplary and so forth. So people in the current age have the same varnas, but not but they're not necessarily trained in qualities of that varna. And then one would question, well, if a person is dishonest and unclean, is he actually of the Brahmana Varna? Because Brahmanas are honest, they're clean, they're controlled, sense controlled, samo, dhamma, they're equal, equal minded, they're equal towards others. So it's a whole package. Not that, oh, I just like to teach, therefore I'm a Brahman. Not really. I mean, not according to the Vedic definition. 
may have that tendency, but you have to cultivate the other qualities. So, the Varnashram Dharma is prescribed for the civilized human being just to train him to successfully terminate human life. Okay, here comes the very interesting part. Self-realization is distinguished from the life of the lower animals engaged in eating, sleeping, fearing, and mating. Bishmadev advised for all human beings nine qualifications. So, you could say that to be qualified as a human being requires more than two arms and two legs. And these are the actually qual qualifications, which is quite interesting because it sort of disqualifies us as human beings. Should I read them? Not to become angry. Have any human beings here? Not to lie, have any human beings here? To equally distribute wealth, to forgive. Isn't that interesting? If you're holding on to resentment, it's not considered the quality of civilized human beings. To beget children only by one's legitimate wife, to be pure in mind and hygienic in body, not to be inimical toward anyone. That's amazing. To be simple and to support servants or subordinates. Mm -hmm. Okay, here comes the heavy line. Fasten your seat belts, everyone. One cannot be called a civilized person without acquiring the above mentioned preliminary qualities. These so are preliminary just for entering human life, getting your stamp. Human being. Okay, now you're human. Now we can talk about spiritual life. One time when Prabhupada was talking about the four principles, no meeting, no 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 illicit sex, no gambling, intoxication, and he said these are not spiritual principles. These are just principles of piety upon which you base your spiritual life. This is the foundation. So, you know, of course, for us, coming from where we came, we thought, like, that's as high as you can go. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, that's just the beginning. That's the foundation. That's not the 10th floor, that's the ground floor. That's the basement, actually. We'll build up from there. Um, and this morning, we were reading, uh, Prabhupada talking about everyone should chant a prescribed number of rounds, and he said, for the Westerners, we've made it really simple. We've made it really easy. Anybody can do this. 16 rounds. Of course, we're thinking, that's way too many. Or many of us are thinking, that's too many. And Prabhupada's saying, we've made it easy for the Westerners, only 16. Why? Because the standard 64. So that means, you know, you get up at 2 o'clock, you chant till 10, then you take breakfast and go to work. That's like normal life for a devotee, right? Previously, so it's just interesting, you know, how our lives are so different. And when I was looking at this purport, I was thinking, this is, it's a challenge to explain these things because thousands of years ago, you wouldn't have to explain these things. This is what you would just know. You would learn from your parents, you would learn in school, you would learn in society. This is how people lived. You know, if somebody left something on the street, nobody stole it. It's just like, okay, the person forgot it, they'll come back. It's, you know. And it is, it is said later in the Bhagavatam that Mother Earth is very tolerant because we're exploiting her and many wars have been fought on her. On her. And she's feeding people, even the people that do bad. So she's very tolerant, but it says you can't tolerate people who lie. Interesting, isn't it? She could tolerate anything, but lying is so bad, or so sinful, or so wrong, that she can't tolerate that. And Prabhupada said something interesting about lying, and I don't exactly understand the science of it. But he said, lying contaminates the atmosphere, and whenever there are epidemics, it's not lying. 
sometimes a, an epidemic can be caused by lying. It pollutes the air. Someone can do their master's or PhD and, and figure that one out, how that works. And I had a theory because um, our president, bless his heart, lies a lot. In fact, he was asked about lying and he said, yeah, it's good not to lie if you can. That was his answer on public, to, you know, to the American public. Yeah, I try not to lie if I can. <laughs> so we've had, we've had some interesting things happen under his administration in terms of fires and hurricanes and, and this is and that. And I thought maybe because he lies so much, it's, just, it's possible. Anyway. It's interesting, because lying is quite common in this day and age. So, um, not to become angry is difficult, and to not be resentful is sometimes difficult. But this one, not to be inimical toward anyone, that's a sign of evil. And this, what, what Bhishma Dev is speaking here, he's not talking about elevated spiritual people, he's talking about just people in general. This is what this is what constitutes a civilized society. And under that is would be considered uncivilized. So now we come to the interesting topic of Vedic culture. What is Vedic culture? Anything such as Vedic culture? Well, interestingly enough, I can't give you a full report, but I just Search on through Prabhupada's books, so two words, Vedic culture, and Prabhupada uses it 1,836 times. So, so then I went through it. Okay, you know, because sometimes we say, well, we're not really trying to be Vedic, we're trying to be Krishna conscious. So, what does Vedic culture mean, anybody? And it's an interesting search if you have a folio, the database, to do it sometime. Because Prabhupada, Prabhupada will say things like, in Vedic culture, blank, 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 blank. According to Vedic culture, blank, 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 blank. People in Vedic culture did blank, 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 blank. So then you start to understand what Prabhupada meant by it. And in Vedic culture, people bathed this way, people married this way, people, people, understood this, uh, people when they were older did this, so that's what you see coming up. And so, but then what you see is something called outside Vedic culture, and outside, what does Vedic mean? Vedic is not an Indian word, it's an English word, did you know that? How many of you know Vedic is an English word? The Sanskrit is Vedika, but the English we say Vedic because if I said Vedika, you would know what I'm talking about. Something which has toxins in it is toxic. That's an English word, right? If something is like something, we use I see. It's toxic. So Veda comes Vedic in English, but it's actually in Sanskrit Vedika. So, so Vedic means what's in the Vedas. That's pretty simple, right? According to the, the teachings of the Vedas and the civilizations that follow those teachings, that's Vedic, right? Of course, you can broaden your definition and say, anything you connect to Krishna is Vedic. You know, it's like a broader. But more specifically, it's what, what is in scripture, uh, and then you can expand it. Okay, anything that's in anything that supports the Vedas, you can say is Vedic. Although academically, you call it something else, like Puranic, or you wouldn't call it Vedic because technically, Vedic can only be what's in the four Vedas. If I mean, if you're taking an exam and they ask you what's Vedic, you'll have to say what's in the four Vedas or the three Vedas. But if you're a devotee, then you say, oh, anything that 
helps you come closer to Krishna, you could say in general, Krishna says, I'm Angol Vedas. So then you can say, Krishna consciousness is Vedic, but technically, what is in the Vedas is Vedic. And people who don't follow the Vedas are considered not Vedic, and they have names for them. Like Mlecha and Yavana. Mlecha means people who eat meat. Because meat eating is not allowed in Vedic culture. Unless it's not a cow and you kill the animal yourself according to certain rituals and rites and chanting mantras. That's Vedic meat eating. So, so if you do that, you're still Vedic. You can still have your Vedic goat burger, but you have to kill it yourself. And you have to be willing to accept the karma of killing. And you know that when you do it, and you have to do the ritual. So that's what it means. So people who don't follow that are considered either malachas or yavanas. So yavana, it's, it's an interesting word. It's, it's basically people who didn't live in India and follow that culture. They were, and there are other names in Bhagavatam. If you read Bhagavatam, they have names for different people around the world. And Kirata, Punindra, Bukasa, you know, Chinese, Turkish, and it was just all these parts of the world that weren't really being influenced by Vedic culture, they're considered outside of the culture. So general general name is Yavana or Malachi. And so um, and the Vedic culture is generally Varna Ashram. People who follow the institution of four Varnas and four Ashrams, four divisions by occupation, four divisions by Ashram, they were considered part of the Vedic culture. If you didn't follow that, you were considered outside. Kind of a summation. So the, the nine qualities that we read now, why is Bhishma Dev speaking that to Yudhisthira? Because he's the king and he's saying, you have to train your citizens to be like this. That's interesting, isn't it? Imagine the prime minister of your country said, okay, now you have to develop these nine qualities, otherwise you'll be arrested. You'll be put in the Yavana prison. But this was actually how kings in those days understood their dharma, their duty, was to educate the citizens to how to act properly. So now Bhishma Dev is telling this to Yudhisthira because you're going to be the king and you want to make sure that this is how people live. It should kind of be a nice society. What do you think? If, if nobody lied, nobody was resentful, nobody was inimical. And what else? Nobody got angry. People were charitable. If they had too much money, they would just go to their neighbor. You need any money? I have too much. I have, like, you know, it's actually sinful to have too much money if it's not used properly. If it's just used for yourself, it's actually considered sinful. It should be equally distributed. Okay. One cannot be called a civilized person without acquiring the above mentioned preliminary qualities. Besides these, the brahmanas, the intelligent men, the administrative men, the mercantile and the laborer class must acquire special qualities in terms of occupational duties mentioned in all the Vedic scriptures. So in Bhagavad Gita you'll see even though I think in the 18th chapter and they'll describe the qualities. If you're a Brahman you have these qualities, you should develop them. Even in all, um, all these classes, had, they had qualities which related to their particular occupation, but they were all good qualities. But they're just specific to their occupation, which made their occupation successful. For the intelligent man, controlling the senses is the most essential qualification. It is the basis of morality. 
sex indulgence, even with a legitimate wife, must also be controlled. And thereby, family control automatically will follow. An intelligent man abuses his great qualification if he does not follow the Vedic way of life. This means he must seriously make a study of Vedic literature, especially of the Srimad Bhagavatam and the Bhagavad Gita. For learning Vedic knowledge, one must approach a person who is 100% engaged in devotional service. He must not do things which are forbidden in the Shastras. A person cannot be a teacher if he drinks or smokes. Hmm. So, time for a story. Sri the Prabhupada met with a devoted businessman. And he met with him early on in the movement for three hours and he told him how to run his company. So, after he talked to Prabhupada, he told his workers, if you eat meat or you drink alcohol or take drugs, you can't work for our company. And so he said that in his industry, in the years, the subsequent years after speaking to Prabhupada, his industry went through a very difficult time, and so many companies in his industry went out of business. But his company flourished. And he said, I'm certain it flourished because I did what Prabhupada said, we followed these principles. So later he told that to Prabhupada, and he said, Srila Prabhupada, if anyone in our company is found to be drinking alcohol or taking drugs or eating meat, we fire him. And Prabhupada said, oh. You're more strict than we are. <laughs> At least we give you a second chance, third chance. <laughs> you know, you know uh, it doesn't seem like a business principle, does it? But anyway, that was interesting. In the modern system of education, the teacher's academic qualification is taken into consideration without evaluation of his moral life. Therefore, the result of education is misuse of high intelligence in so many ways. So, in, in um, the present age, things are, are very mixed up. They're not so clear. We were talking about nature when we're having our retreat in India. What's your nature? I'm one devotee raised his hand and said, I like to teach, I like to administrate, I like to make money, and I like to fix things. I think I'm all for harness. And so we were discussing how in in this age Many things are very mixed up, like what Prabhupada is describing here. You have intellectual class, you have brilliant people, but morally bankrupt. Whereas in traditional Vedic society, that, that didn't, if they were intellectual, priestly, they naturally were controlled and had high morals. But now it's, it, you, get, you get it mixed up, very mixed up. It's not so clear, right? But anyway, wh whatever you are cultivating in terms of occupation, you want to try to cultivate those qualities. That's how you can best execute your duty, just like many of us are Brahmins. And so what is the primary qualification of a Brahmin? He must be an exemplar of what he teaches, right? That's so important. Acharya. Guru is called Acharya, one who is teaching by example. That's what it means. This one teacher, he observed, because he teaches, he observed that when you teach something, people are always questioning. I wonder if this person does what he's telling me to do. That's just in people's minds. 
And if the person is not doing what he's telling other people to do, then people think, this doesn't make sense. How am I expected to do it? He can't even do it. Isn't it? Yes? And we know the story of Gandhi who wouldn't ask the young boy not to eat sugar for a week or some people say a month because he first had to stop eating sugar before he felt he had the power to tell this boy or, or that his words would have any power. So this is just one example of how within the culture of our nashram, it's not just what you're inclined to do, but it's the qualities. Like the warrior class, they had principles. They were, it's, it's so interesting for us to read about how they fought battle and the principles they followed because the battle started at sunrise and it ended at sunset and you couldn't fire a weapon after sunset, which is in modern day battle, all the bombs are dropped at night. Isn't it about 3 a.m. when everybody's sleeping, right? And so the sun would set, the battle would stop and they'd all meet together and have dinner and talk about the day's battle. What do you think of that? Interesting, right? And along the sidelines was the crowd watching the battle. What do you think of that? So it's kind of like for us to understand Vedic culture, we don't have much context. And so sometimes it just like doesn't make sense and we're like bending our head and like, this is strange. And, but but if you understand, if you begin to understand it within the context, it makes sense. It just doesn't make sense in our context. And a lot of things that we read about in Vedic times, they'll never make sense in our context. We can't do it now. We don't have that society. So it's not that our goal is to make everything Vedic, because if we did that, we might end up in prison. It's just, it's not the way the social system works. So for us, Vedic is connecting with Krishna. I mean, we'd end up in prison for trying to change society. Yeah, all right, what are we going to do? Well, number one, we'll, we should definitely bomb all the abortion clinics and slaughterhouses, right? Because you know, it's not Vedic to have slaughterhouses and abortion clinics, right? So obviously, we're not going to do these things. So that takes some, you know, intelligence of how we would apply what the so-called Vedic, which is not always necessary and applicable within the present context. So we have to adapt intelligently. That's the key word. Okay. So if you want to be a Brahmin, you want to follow the medical culture, then we're going to go in your room and see if it's clean and organized because it isn't. You're not going to get five gold stars for a Brahma. One time, uh, Prabhupada did something interesting. He just showed up. He was staying. He was staying outside of one of our temples. It was a very small temple. It was just a house. And it was near San Francisco. And Prabhupada had come to San Francisco for Rathyatra. But he was staying in his house about a half hour from San Francisco. And it was maybe 10 minutes from the temple. And Prabhupada takes morning walks. So he just walked into the temple. Like nobody knew he was coming. That was interesting. And he walked into the Brahmachari ashram and then gave his declaration. Brahmachari means dirty. That was the declaration. De declaration after seeing the Brahmacharya Ashram. So, in one lecture, Prabhupada said, and "There's a verse I don't know, verse or shloka, or just a saying in India that this thread. You don't become a Brahmin by purchasing a thread. In those days, it was two paisa, two paisa. Like it would cost a few cents." 
You don't become a Brahmin by virtue of the thread, but you become a Brahmin by qualification. So sometimes Prabhupada would talk about this in terms of the condition of India that many people are born as Brahmins. And sometimes you'll see them and they'll go like this. Have you ever, have you ever seen any of you do this? I'm a Brahmin. And this is this is your qualification. So that, that means when they were eight years old, their family priest uh, gave them the Brahma Gayatri mantra. Whether they chant or not, is, I, I don't know. But let's say even they chant, they were given the Brahma Gayatri mantra by their family priest. That's a tradition in their family, and they say, therefore, I'm a Brahmin. But Brahmins are not employed by other people. Brahmins work solely for the welfare of others, and they don't charge. They're supported by donations. That's a Brahmin. So a Brahmin is a teacher. He may give, a Brahmin is an astrologer. Uh, a Brahmin is a doc doctor. And they used to go to homes. They would give their astrology. They would give their spiritual knowledge. They would give their, um, they would give their advice, medical advice and so forth. And then people would give them donations and they would have their schools and generally their school was a little raised area around the trunk of a tree that they would sit on and their students would sit under the tree the 10 or 15 or 20 students and and I was in a village in India and we actually went we, we went during the day and we went by the school and that's what it was it was a tree and the Brahmin was teaching like 20 kids and they just build with mud a little bit up around the trunk and he sits there, that's his platform. And he teaches and there's no charge. And the parents of the kids will give some donation or they'll give some cloth, they'll bring him some food or whatever. And that's a Brahmin. That's, that's what Brahmins do. So nowadays you have many teachers and um, I have experience personally. You can go to their workshops if you can find about four thousand dollars. You can go, and they're so kind to give you a discount off their original price of ten thousand dollars. And if you're the if you're the first twenty people, you'll get it for only three thousand. And they're fabulously wealthy. And there's a joke when you go to the uh, workshop about how to make a million dollars, the only person who makes the million is the one who gives the workshop, not the people who attend. So, so Brahmins, this was their qualification. So it, it's not just that they were teachers, but there was a, there was a moral conduct of how it worked. They, were, they offered themselves to society. They were servants of society. And so if one says, I'm a Brahmin, and they're, they've got a job at Google writing code, that's not a Brahmin. When you're employed by an employer, that's called Shudra. And of course, when we hear the word Shudra, people say, hey, you calling me a Shudra? Let's go outside and talk about this. No, Shudra's not a bad word. It just defines an occupation. Right? So if I'm, I'm a teacher, but I'm hired by an institution to teach for a salary, I'm not a Brahmin, I'm a Shudra who's teaching. So Shudras can teach, Shudras can participate in, in military activity, they can help actual chapters. If I'm sitting in an office on my computer throwing bombs in Syria, or what do they call those? Those uh, drones, yeah. I'm, I'm not a chanter, I'm just a technician. I, and I come home at night to my family. How was your day, John? Oh, well, killed about 400,000 people here yeah. again. Um, but it's a technical job. You're not chantria. One of the qualifications of military men is they're courageous. So, and, and what we find from Mahabharata is that if there is an opportunity to fight, especially for a religious cause, the chantry, the warrior class, 
they jump. They go, wow, this, I could die for this cause. This is great. That's a chantra. And chantras, interestingly, they're also forgiving. So they're not fighting out of anger. They're fighting for dharma. They're fighting for cause, for justice, for um, dedicated to a cause, ideally the cause of dharma, religion. That's what they fight. And for religion, they're willing to give up their life. They're not afraid. And they don't go to the battle and go, oh my God, I can't do this, and run off. That's what Arjuna did. It was, it was such a um, weird situation because Arjuna is one of the most powerful fighters in the world, and he threw down his weapon. And Krishna was like, couldn't believe it. What are you doing? This is the moment of truth, and you're one of the most powerful fighters. And you're putting down a weapon. This is not what Chaturias do. And Krishna said, Chaturias love the opportunity to sacrifice their life for Dharma. That's what it means to be a Chaturia. There's a story. Maybe someone knows the details, but one devotee, one person was a Chaturia playing the part of a Brahmin, and his guru fell asleep. What's that? To who was that? Karna was Karna, and who was his guru? Parashuram. So Parashuram falls asleep on his lap, and he, well, I guess he was, he wanted to be trained as a Brahmin, is that correct? And what was happening? Some insects? Yeah, some of these insects that yeah. drill into your body, extremely painful. And so because Parashuram is sleeping on his lap, he doesn't move. He want to move. And so when he wakes up and he sees what happened, he said, you could not be a Brahmin because you could, a Brahmin could not tolerate that pain. Only a Chaturya could tolerate that pain. Isn't that interesting? You could, you could understand by various symptoms who is a Brahmin, who is a Chaturya. There's no, and so Chaturyas were, they were like, like amazing persons. Amazingly powerful. And then you have stories of one warrior fighting a thousand men or ten thousand men. And it's describing he's shooting arrows like hundreds of arrows per nanosecond. <laughs> like just incredible things we can't even fathom. It's only it's only stuff of Hollywood. But it was actually true. These people were incredibly incredible persons, incredibly powerful. And then we hear about the kingdom of Yudhisthira, we hear about the kingdom of Marsh Prickshin, that they were so powerful that there was no crime, that people were afraid to commit a crime because they would be punished. The government was such, so powerful, that just criminals did not exist. And then one criminal came, Kali personified, and um, Prickshin Mara said, well, you, you deserve to be killed because you were killing a cow, not a bull. And he said, no, please don't spare me. And he said, okay, because you are Kali, you can go wherever there is meat-eating, illicit sex, intoxication, and gambling. And Las Vegas hadn't yet been developed. So Kali said, well, you know, in the, in the Hollywood version, well, that's Las Vegas, and Las Vegas hasn't been developed. And there's nowhere in your kingdom where there's any meeting, eating, hoarding of gold, intoxication, illicit sex, it doesn't exist, so I have no place to go. And he foretold Las Vegas. He said, go where they're hoarding gold, because where they're hoarding gold, all the other stuff's going to go on, if you can find that place. But his point was, it didn't exist in his kingdom. Isn't that interesting? That's like inconceivable. You know, because in America, they had, they had tried to make alcohol illegal. And they went all the stores that had alcohol and just took the bottles and broke them. And there was no alcohol. And the people went absolutely crazy. And people were making alcohol in their, in their homes, in their tubs. And, and so after a few years, the, the government gave up. It was useless. They couldn't control it. So to imagine there's a government that's controlling these things and punishing people for uh, committing crimes. To such an extent that there is no crime. That's amazing. That's inconceivable. How did that happen? What kind of power did these chakras have? 
Now, vices or business people. What are business people doing today? Well, let's first look at what Krishna says business people should do. They should grow food. Yeah, interesting, you know. I've got my Harvard, I got my um, MBA from Harvard. Well, what are you gonna do with it? I'm gonna grow food. Go to the local, local farmer's market and sell it. That's, that's what a Vaisha does. And I'm gonna protect cows. That's what they do. And also, there'll be some money lending and some business. But things such as real estate investing and so forth, and stock market, that wasn't, that's not the description of what Avaisha does. Avaisha is providing necessities, that's their duty, to provide what people need. Are Vaishas providing what we need? Yes, some do. Are they providing what we don't need? Yes. A lot of things we don't need. So now Vaisha business is all about bottom line, making money. If you can make money, you're a good business person. You're you're honored, but you may be creating a product that we don't need. What to speak of a product that is unhealthy, like these things? Now, let me tell you about these things. You know about these things? You've seen them before. You you know what they do. So, there was a very wise man who said. we should test it to see the effect it has on our physical, emotional, mental, social realities or conditions. So that's actually the function of Brahmins because Brahmins, if they are detrimental in society, they will tell the Chatras, this should not be allowed. And I think they would have done that with these. If we had a Brahminical society, when these came on the market, the Brahmins would be looking at these and analyzing. And um, the Vaishya community would be controlled by the Brahmins. No, this app is not allowed, that app is not allowed, blah, 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 blah. Only it must be beneficial for the people, and there must be a chip in that turns your phone off every night at 8 o'clock and doesn't turn it on till 8 a.m. in the morning. It works with the sun and you can't get it on. Um, but, but you understand the principle, in Brahminical society, the Brahmins are, are always thinking about what is good or bad for the public, and they guide the administrative class, and, the, and they guide the mercantile class. And so there won't be businesses which are harmful. Isn't that interesting? Have you ever thought like that? Like, why? Why is the government allowing this product? This product is so bad for you. It's got so much poison in it. Even on the jars of chemotherapy, you know what it says? It's carcinogenic. Did you know that? Yeah, you could explain it. Chemotherapy is carcinogenic. Oh my God. Okay. Anyway, um, you probably know the politics and economics of health. The health is big business, so it's probably not a good idea to like be able to cure any disease too easily and too inexpensively, because that would put a lot of hospitals out of business. And their biggest uh, money makers are cancer and heart disease. So you definitely don't want to come up with any cure for cancer or heart disease if you value your life, because you will be shocked. There are many people in America who were missing because they were curing people of these diseases. Did you know that? just missing or they were shut down and they have testimonials of hundreds of people who cured their cancer and their businesses were shut down so where you have brahmins this is not allowed this would not happen and vaishas are following the directions of brahmins and so vaishas it's a service they do business to support society with food with uh, protection of animals and other necessities I don't know if this is happening in your country, but in more and more in America, the urbanization of our farmland is turning acres and acres, hundreds, thousands of acres of land into suburbs. And all the suburbs in America, they look the same. 
wherever you land in any city or state, you think you've never gone anywhere else. They all look the same. The same stores, everything looks the same. The same malls, the same franchises. And, and when you're driving around America, you think, 10 years ago, this was all farmland. Now there's acres and acres and acres of apartments and stores and you know, people that are living there. And you think, okay, so all this food that was grown, where does it come from? Because it's not being grown anymore. And as you go through, well, Candace is from California. You must have seen it in California. California is one of the biggest producers of food in America. And you go back to these places and it's all suburbs and new homes, yes? And Starbucks and McDonald's and Walmart and, and every mall that you go to, just remember, once upon a time, this was somebody's farm. And now you're walking around this most artificial environment God is, the humans have ever created, where people are going mad shopping, thinking that this is what they need. That was a farm once upon a time. That's it. And a happy family was living on a farm, eating food that was actually nutritious, unlike the food we get today. So where is the food in America coming from if we're urbanizing the farmland? It's coming from another country. Mexico, Brazil, uh, Indonesia, we get our coconuts, get our mangoes from Mexico, our bananas from Mexico. Um, so, once upon a time, we did a tour of uh, India with some people, and one gentleman on the tour told me he read a book, and it was how civilizations collapse, and there are certain symptoms of collapse, preliminary symptoms before they collapse. And he said, America has all the symptoms of every civilization in the history of the world that has collapsed. And one of those is they can't produce enough food for their own people. Isn't that interesting? And when Prabhupada went to Mauritius, they were growing sugar cane because they had a contract with Europe to provide sugar for Europe. And Prabhupada said, what are you doing? He said, first you grow all the food you need before you export it. Self-sufficiency. In Mexico, they produce oil, and then they sell the oil to America, and then they buy petrol from the Americans. So, you know, so we sell, Mauritius sells all their sugar to Europe, they get money, and then they import everything else they need from Europe. And all that so Prabhupada spoke about this. So, um, the Brahmins wouldn't allow this. This is not what is the duty of the Vaishyas. So anyway, this is the whole discussion. I've only read a little bit, so this discussion will continue in the subsequent classes. But that's just a few things I wanted to say about this. And now it's too late. Unless you don't want to eat breakfast. Okay, I'll let you decide what you want to do. Does anyone have any questions? It's my last day, come on. I can always say my welcome. Yes. Yes. Well, providers of food, like. She said, she said all the all the ashrams are providers, so why would we say the Vaishas are providers? Providers of food. Yeah, that's what I that's their one of their one of their main job descriptions is to provide food. Without which the others could be providers, but you're right, the others are they're all providers of providers of the basic necessities. Food. Um, the shooters provide labor to the other classes, which is obviously necessary. Brahmins provide knowledge, chatras provide administrative um, guidance and so forth. Yes, thank you. 
Based on the knowledge of the Vedas, which is knowledge which gives you vision of how to live. Yeah. I mean, technically speaking, Vedic means of the of the Vedas, and Prabhupada sometimes says Veda means knowledge. Whatever is knowledge is Vedic. So, um, it's a it's it's a more appropriate definition for us not living in a Vedic age that what is knowledge we can say is Vedic or Veda. What is true. And therefore, we are trying to to live and teach what is true, and also what is sattvic. Because when we when we try to be Vedic, then that sometimes, in a cultural sense, can be uh, difficult or sometimes impossible because we don't have the context or the sound stars. Even even sometimes, you try to teach somebody how to cook something, and they're not Indian. And they just somehow or other, even though you teach them, they just needed to learn from an Indian mother when they were five how to do it. Otherwise, it's like, they can't get it. It's fun, you know. So some things culturally, we need to be raised with to actually live it and understand it. I have personal experience with chapatis. Indians are just, they know how to make chapatis. Any flour you give them, they know how to cook them. Yes. Well, uh, there's a couple of things that um, are being done that are interesting. In England, I understand that they're paying farmers to not kill their cows. Say, how much would you sell this cow for? Okay, we'll buy it. And how much does it cost to maintain it? This much a year, we'll pay. Just don't kill it and, and we'll maintain it. So other farmers in the area are now taking care of cows because we have the money to protect them. Um, Bhakti Chudu Swami, I think, has purchased 600 acres of land just to protect cows, and so has as much money as he can get. He's buying cows and also taking cows from other Iskand temples where they can't take care of them. So that's what we're supposed to do. That's one thing. But obviously, you know, giving knowledge is what we're doing, it's the main thing. And this is a big topic, you know, being Vedic and what is and what isn't and how to do it and how Vedic are you and step up through the Vedic security gate. And, you know, if you're not, you know, you don't get 10 points, then you have to do something. Um, the interesting thing is that I think any of us who joined during Prabhupada's time, we had no we had no concept that we were trying to be Vedic. In fact, we thought we we're not trying to be Vedic. We just thought we we're trying to be Vaishnav. And so when anybody talked about being Vedic, we would think, what are you talking about? That's not so we didn't we didn't house things within the Vedic concept. It was always housed within Vaishnav concepts. You know? Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavatam, Bhakti Shastra. 
So that's interesting. I'm not saying it's here or there, it's just interesting. That was how we grew up as young devotees. I don't know if in your generation it was similar, was it? Same thing. It's like we're trying to spread knowledge and you know, Vaishnavism is higher than Varnashram. And then then the idea of Varnashram, of course, Prabhupada started talking about it as a means of of helping the whole world. And I think these topics are, you know, they need discussion. They need thoughtfulness. The thing that's so interesting that I find, like with what Rina Nanamarsh is doing with Krishna West, the thing that I find so interesting is that in so many communities I go where there is no attempt to create Krishna West, it's already pretty much Krishna West anyway, because we're Westerners. And so we just because we that's what we are, that's how we adapt Krishna consciousness. So if you want to prove my theory true, go door to door, knocking on devotees' homes and you know at noon and see how they're dressed and how many saris and how many dhotis. That will be minority, if any, isn't it? Because we're Western, so you know, and what do we eat? You know, Vedic pizza. You know, you gotta make your pizza on a chapati, otherwise it's bogus. No. You know, do we like pizza? Yeah. Is pizza Vedic? Well, you offer it, I guess. You know, so so how important these things are or are not, that's subject to questioning. But the main thing of course is to be Christian conscious. One thing I saw with Prabhupada is when we did things which aren't weren't so Vedic or traditional in terms of cooking or presenting Krishna consciousness to the public, he would ask, "Is it necessary? You know, do you really need to do this? It's not. It's not representing our traditional culture. Do you need to do this? Like sometimes when we would distribute prasadam, we found you may not find this, but we found and when we would go to college campuses, you know, if we distributed sweets and they'd never seen them before, they were our Indian sweets, a lot of people wouldn't take them. So we had a switch in the cookies and then 99.9% .9 of people took them. But the other ones is like 60%, 40%. So things like that, you know, so, you know, we want people to take food cooked in, in ghee, so they'll stop eating meat and, and sand dish and like, but if they look at it, I go, what's that? Or I've done high school programs where we pass out our Vedic sweet and most of them were still sitting on the table. You pass out cookies, immediately they're eating. It's just a reality. So Prabhupada, was, you know, he wanted us to do a lot of things that didn't work. And so, you know, I used to go out and do kirtan when I lived in Mauritius and I had a keyboard and a drum machine. And I, my one man band, could attract a crowd of 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 100 people, just myself, because I had my keyboard and my drum machine and my sound system. But me, just with cartels, nobody would even pay attention. So, is it needed? Do you really need it? Well, Prabhupada. We can attract so many people and distribute so many books if we do it this way. Okay, very good. That's what I said with Prabhupada. Then Prabhupada, once uh, we, we told Prabhupada, we, instead of doing Sankirtan in Western dress, we're, do, we're doing it in Dodi and Sari because we feel that we don't have to wear Western dress. And Prabhupada said, we said, okay, whatever you're comfortable with. That was his answer. It wasn't like, oh, great, you know, you've, you're, you're a Paramahansa because you realize you could distribute a book in a dhoti and people won't run away from you. It was, it was whatever you're comfortable with is fine. That was really interesting because Prabhupada could have said, yes, you're, you're representing our culture by dressing this way. He said, no, whatever you're comfortable with. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, it's kind of a detachment. We're attached to what works. We're attached to helping people. But I just think it's interesting because most communities I go to kind of in the West are very Western. They're very much like the other people in their country, except we're devotees. And we do things a little differently, but we're pretty much the same. I was with a god brother in Vrindavan, and he lived in Vrindavan for 20 years, and he's from New York. And after 20 years in Vrindavan, he was still like 99% New York. That was his nature, that was his blood. He was a wonderful devotee, but his mannerisms, his jokes, the way he dealt with people, and you think after 20 years in India, you might be a little, yes, yes, many, many, and some devotees are, but, he wasn't, and many people aren't. It's just, we are who we are, and some devotees will be very Vedic, and they'll, you know, they'll be totally Indian because that's what they like. All right, so, all right, why not? Whatever works. So we should stop, right? Because this could go forever, and prasadam will not go forever. So thank you very much. Sri the Prabhupada ki jai, go Gorbak to Brenda Kiza. Thank you.